Tonight we are joined by two talented authors. Um, I hope I'm saying this name, this name right. Matthew Saleses. Yeah, that's great. Oh my God. Has <laughs> um, <laughs> received awards and fellowships from the Breadloaf Writers Conference, Glimmer, Train, Mid American Review, Pank, HTML, Giant, Impact, Imprint, and elsewhere. He did his MFA at Emerson College and is currently a Camber Fellow and PhD candidate at the University of Houston. And Alexander Kleeman's fiction has been published in the Paris Review, Zoe Trope, All Story Junctions, Guernica, and Gulf Coast, amongst others. She is currently a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley, and this is her debut novel. Um, my book is called You Two Can Have a Body Like Mine, and um, it is difficult to summarize, but basically my question in writing it was, um, uh, what happens to the missing person in the missing person's case? You know, what is the experience of falling out of your own life like? And um, w this other place that you might hope to escape to, like, is it a true escape or is it maybe a reflection and some distorted version of the place that you were escaping from? Um, there is no elsewhere in this book. So I'm um, going to read a short passage, and um, all you really need to know that is that uh, C is our narrator's boyfriend. Okay. I had started dating C a couple of years ago during the fall when fathers began vanishing from out of their comfortable middle-class homes. For the first few weeks, local newscasters read out the list of the newly vanished each night along with the locations in which they were last seen, and it sounded as if they were reading from a master catalog of legitimate, reasonable names, names like Peter and Steve. Ted Hartwell, Matt Schofield, Dennis Gulp. None of them knew one another, and there was nothing to link them except that they were all equally average. Telephone poles and store windows went white, with flyers depicting men in interchangeable hairstyles clad in polo shirts. All traces of fun leached from their faces long ago. They wore confused expressions in the pictures selected by their family members, as if none of their kin had cared to warn them the photographs were going to be taken. Their confusion made it seem as though they had been lost for a long time, much longer than they had been gone. The news anchors called it disappearing dad disorder. For months, nobody knew where the dads had gone, whether they had been stolen or had stolen themselves, victims of self-napping. Then last January, dads started turning up one by one. Good Samaritans found them wandering dazed in shopping malls five towns over. Malls that were not their own, but resembled their own to an uncanny degree. They would return to familiar stores like The Gap and try to buy khakis with little scraps of paper that they had collected from obscure places. They sat on the mall benches and closed their eyes, waiting for someone to claim them. Often they wore clothes identical to the ones they had disappeared in, identical but fresh smelling, as if they had been laundered or even bought new in the same sizes and colors. They were confused and quiet, preferring to stare off into the distance or fiddle with a keychain instead of engaging with those around them, those who asked them gently, are you lost? Is your family looking for you? Do you have a number we can call? When questioned about their disappearance, whether they had left or been taken, who had taken <coughs> them, did they remember his face, height, manner of dress, the missing dads reproduced with slight variations in phrasing, a single sentence. Sometimes you've just got to be content with things the way they are. The emptiness of C's apartment reminded me of those missing fathers. The place was nice the way car dealerships are nice. Clean, spacious, cold, and full of light. He owned two of the same self-assembled couches and three identical self-assembled end tables, the cheapest model they made. These were all arranged in his living room, the couches side by side, gaplessly, and facing forward to the television set, the end tables pushed together in front of them to form a single, long, low table from which you could eat if you hunched over and lowered your jaw almost to your knees. From the door, you could see the living room, kitchen, and a chunk of bedroom splayed before you, like some blueprint of a place an engineer had once thought might be okay to live in. I took a few steps toward the door, and the bedroom came into view, a full-sized mattress on the floor with navy blue sheets and a wad of comforter. Next to it, a laptop blinked. Did you just move in? I asked, hoping that he had. C laughed. People always ask that. I've been living here two years, two and a half, really, he added. Where do you keep your things? I asked. 
and he gestured all around us. C did graphic design for a small advertising agency, but this had almost nothing to do with his life. He left for work around 8.30 or 9 in the morning and returned unchanged, with few memories of where he had been. If I asked about his work, he seemed surprised to be reminded of it, then annoyed. If you want to talk about dead-end jobs, he'd say, why don't you talk about your own? And I would respond to this by saying nothing at all. I pictured him as a hot air balloon, saggy and bright, tethered to the earth by three or four flimsy ropes. The person who lived in this bare, depressing apartment was about one rope from falling off the face of the earth, I decided. Are you one of those people who acts normal, but is secretly about to check their lives and disappear, I asked. If that were the case, I wasn't going to waste my time getting to know him. But I knew we'd be dating for a while when he laughed loudly and kissed me for what was then the third or fourth time ever. Yeah, right. No way. Neither are you, he said. I've seen that on TV, those dads, and it is nuts. Everything's worked out great for me since whenever. I don't have any plans to make it complicated. Besides, I'm attached to my material goods. What material goods, I wondered. Then I followed the arc of his arm, pointing to a location across the room. He had been referring to his collection of DVDs, heaps of horror and comedy and porn, stacked together in a pile the size of a small love seat. What was at the root of disappearing dad disorder? Sociologists said it was social, psychologists said it was psychological, and some religious nuts said they had heard a call from God to leave behind their wicked lives. Biologists compared with migration and with songbirds had become confused in the presence of skyscrapers. They compared them with honeybees who abandoned their hives. Maybe the fathers had been misled by cell phone signals, by highways, by toxins in the water supply. An American studies professor from Cornell argued that it had to do with the breakdown of the single earner family model upon which our common baseline for masculine worth was founded. A comedian said that all husbands were on the verge of disappearing only there was still such a thing as a football season, and then a basketball season, and then a baseball season. Possible explanations for the self-napping were offered up in interviews with abandoned wives. Their husband was a sneaky rat and had been since the earliest days, the days when they were courting and he often forgot his wallet, forcing her to pay for the entirety of their meal. Their husband was well-intentioned, but also a doofus, he had trouble with navigation, even in their own moderately sized gated community. His absence was surely an exaggerated case of the many instances in which his sense of direction failed completely, even as he continued to insist upon its, quote, pinpoint precision. Their husband had loved them very much, particularly in the beginning, but in recent years she had noticed that he had noticed that the backs of her arms jiggled when she waved hello, that there were spots that were not freckles distributed among her freckles, that her joints made loud cracking sounds when they made love, which sometimes caused him to ask her if she was all right. <laughs> but maybe the fathers were just seeking a perfect life, which when you think about it is a completely reasonable thing to do. They wanted the good things, the popcorn, the corn dogs, the plush industrial mall carpeting with its geometric patterns screaming themselves in green, pink, and brick red, stretching across the concourse like a little fragment of infinity. They didn't want the bad things, the pressure, the stress, the weekly division of chores by chore wheel, the homework that they thought they had done away with when they graduated elementary school or middle school or high school or business school. They didn't want the gift curse of recognition by those they loved and who loved them back. One consequence of that love's durability being that they would be recognized and loved aggressively even on days when they couldn't stand to recognize themselves in the mirror even on days when merely remembering themselves made them sad and want to sleep. Love that made every day a day that they had to live in a handcrafted, artisanal fashion, rather than being outsourced to someone who could do it happily and efficiently for a third of the price. They might have thought, to use a stock phrase, that somewhere out there was a way to have their cake and eat it too. That many of them returned to their homes months later, malnourished, dehydrated, and amnesiac could be interpreted as evidence that there is no cake anywhere in the world to be had or eaten. Thank you. <laughs>
got all these audio books when they sent me copies of the books and I don't know what to do with them so I decided to give away some at readings. Um, and I'm going to give away two audio books, one on CD and one on MP3 CD, which apparently is a different thing. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to give them away to people with the best bad jokes. So, and I'll give you a few examples. Um, part of the book kind of deals with myth and superstition, uh, and there's a list that I'll read from um, that's really on the first page of the book that kind of uh, goes through the entire book um, of different superstitions in Prague. And uh, as I started writing those, I, I, you know, and learning about those, I was also kind of thinking about how they operated as jokes. And so I wrote a few jokes into the book, too. Uh, and I'm going to tell them, because they're terrible, and they're amazing. <laughs> and I'm a dad now, so it all makes sense. You know, like before, I couldn't really say I like bad jokes, and now it's like, well, I'm a dad, you know? <laughs> what else would I like? You know? um, so my favorite one goes like this. What is this? It's a flock of bees. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my daughter's favorite is, where do pigs park? The parking lot. <laughs> and the last one is, why do seagulls fly over the ocean and not the bay? Because then they'd be bagels. Because then they'd be bagels, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I want to hear some other bad jokes. I've got... You know, you gotta at least give me two. I have one. Yeah. Um, how did Harry Potter get down the hill? Walking, JK Rowling. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Which one do you want? <laughs> audio CD or MP3 CD? Um, audio, please. <laughs> please. Yeah. Why did the children wait? Why did, they, why did the children cross the park? I have no idea. To get to the other slide. <laughs> I don't know if that gets one. <laughs> so thank you for indulging me. Uh, I started this book eleven years ago when I was living in Prague for a year, teaching English and kind of running around the city on, on the metro and full time was 20 hours a week. It was amazing. And what I was doing was t having conversations with people one on one. And since the whole thing was getting them to talk in English, I just kind of talked what about whatever I wanted to talk about, which happened to be what the myths of Prague were um, for some reason. I mean, because they're awesome. So I'm going to read from the beginning of the book and then from a little bit in chapter one. Myths. Before his father came and flew him back to Massachusetts General Hospital in September of 2002, these are the things he learned in Prague. One, if someone sneezes while you're talking, what you're saying is true. Two, if your nose is soft, you're lying. Three, if you cut an apple in half and see a star, it's good luck. If not, it's bad. Four, if you step in it's good luck. Five, if you pour molten lead into water, you can tell the future from the form it makes. Six, if your hand itches, you'll get into a fight. Seven, if your nose itches, you'll get beaten up. <laughs> Eight, if you pour something and it overflows, someone you know will get pregnant. Nine, if you lift your feet for someone to sweep under them, you'll never marry. 10. To cry at the wrong grave means to bark up the wrong tree. I like that one. 11. Often the legends of Prague have to do with selling one's soul to the devil. 12. Half of Prague will be destroyed by fire, half by water. 13. When the Czech Republic is in its most desperate hour of need, a sleeping army under the hill Blanik will awaken and defeat its enemies. T wrote this list during his first week in the hospital. He woke on a wet pillow and he scrambled over the railing of his bed and fell to the floor. He pinched his nose shut. Water rushed over him, thick and brown, but he could breathe. 
He stood and rested the back of his hand on his pillow. He'd cried in his sleep again. He smoothed down his dry hospital gown and went to the window. The river outside was the Charles in Boston, not the Voltava in Prague. He pressed a sheet of paper against the glass, blocking the view, and wrote until the words blurred. When a doctor knocked at the door, he touched the bandage around his head and told himself there was no flood. He was in Boston. The doctor switched on the x-ray board, and they stared at the back of T's skull. Where T had been hit, the nerves had fused together in shock, and the skin had knotted and died until a surgeon had to cut it off. T knew who had attacked him, probably. A Czech with an American name, Rockefeller, someone T had called friend. T couldn't remember exactly what had happened. The impact had caused some rare brain damage. He couldn't tell dates or remember song lyrics. Are you listening? The doctor asked. He stood on one leg and the doctor tested his balance. The solidity of the floor shifted like weather. For the second time that day, he was back in Prague. He was running naked under the fireworks on New Year's Eve, the wind slapping his chest. People pushed and sang and embraced, then the back of a glowing leg slipped through the crowd. A woman walked out of T's hospital room, but no one had been inside except the doctor and T. T started forward and his balance gave out. The doctor held him up, linking arms, and called for a nurse. The doctor said T had to want to recover. T had seen that leg, that calf, before. Where? Later that month, T would transfer to a rehabilitation center meant to reorient him to the world he'd never understood. He would stumble down the halls, searching for a ghost. He took to stopping other patients and prompting them with abstract nouns. They had to get used to every kind of bewilderment. Love, he would say, hands trembling, and someone willing might answer, what goes up comes down, or if you give a mouse a cookie. Regret, he would say, and someone might answer, a wish for a perfect life, or aging. Hate, he would say, and some would remember why they were there. Okay, so this is from chapter two, Ghosts. In August, in Prague, the flood would seem a surprise. Those storms came and went for weeks beforehand. Police and firefighters raised steel barriers along the embankments in Old Town, but left the Carling district unprotected. On the news, a former construction worker warned that buildings in Carling could collapse, built too quickly, with unfired bricks. An analyst predicted deaths and lawsuits. The city surrendered its boundaries. Citizens defended museums and places of worship with sandbags. In the rain, evacuation was ordered, but people thronged to bridges and riverbanks to watch. Sections of sidewalk buckled like tiny tectonic plates. Trees tipped over in the oversaturated soil and had to be tethered like barges. Metro lines were shut down too late to protect them. The river washed parts of other cities into Prague. The river pulled down levees, then buildings. The river washed parts of Prague into parts of, in other parts of Prague, and then into the rest of Europe. From where T watched, in his second floor apartment, the flood made a high brown sea just below his window. He smelled the sewage in the water. He wondered how he had let himself miss the signs. How strange the way we wade into disaster, step after step, not realizing how far we've gone until we're drowning. Just before the flood, Katka had asked about Korea as the raindrops formed fat planets against the window pane. Her finger followed the streaks across the glass. A Korean friend told me once about his visits as a kid, he said. Everyone looked like him, but he still didn't belong. Katka touched her temple where her skin met her hair. No one your age, she said, feels like he belongs. How did she really see him? His quick black eyes, the scar on his chin that toughened his boyishness, his flat cheeks and curved nose, the cream in his brown skin 
that seemed to make white people touch him without realizing. He was a believer, as Pavel had painted. In college, he had listed ambitions, get a girlfriend, be a writer, drink more water, fall in love. He had believed in the kind of weight that could drag whatever fluttered in his throat down to more comfortable depths of some place or someone. Kaka smoothed her hair and he said, you don't know what it's like to be adopted. People see you as who you were at birth, but you're not that person. At that point, the flood was still weeks off. He opened the window and caught rain in the cup of his palm. Katka pulled his hand in, and for a moment, he thought for some reason that she would lower her lips to the water and drink. She splashed his face. He pulled back in anger, but her grin conquered him. Thank you. I have a question for Matt. Uh, you said it took you uh, 11 years to write this book, and in that time you've like started and finished like many other books. What, I guess, was it about this one that you didn't like said it like leave it aside permanently like what was it that sort of like clung to you I guess like well, all this time I think it took me a long time to figure out what I was doing in Prague in you know when I was 22 and why I would start a book then and and, and also like why I was clinging to it um, one is I'm just really stubborn you know my, as my wife would gladly attest and um, but I, I, there was something about it, you know, I just, as you start to work on something for so long, you get attached to it, but then also, like, I felt like the sentences were good because I had honed them for so long, and I was like, I can't give up on all of these good sentences. <laughs> like, I said, I never do that. Um, but the other books were kind of side projects for this, to this one, where it was like, oh, you know, 11 years, I'm like, this is terrible. There must be something I can do that I can finish. And so I did those things just so I could finish something. Mm -hmm. How long did it take you to do it? I think that I, uh, I started writing it um, at the end of, in uh, May 2011. <laughs> I, no, I started writing it in May 2011, but I had been thinking about writing it for like three years beforehand, and I don't think that I have, I don't have, that many good ideas so when I find one like I have to hold on to it <laughs> and make sure I don't uh, let it go until it's completely finished so um, two years writing that a year of editing and uh, I'm so grateful to my editor who's at Little A now Barry um, for helping me do the revision I always wanted to do this last time we were so young in this house so old and after a hard day on the job, in the heat, the dust and the noise, learning the ropes on icy staging, in the wind, with the snow-covered ground so far below, my fingers remember it all.